Hello, I'm Kieran Lynch, and welcome to Lovicast, the Chaco Sheep Podcast. Each episode, we bring you lots insights, advice, and technical updates for the sheep industry. Now, in this week's episode, we catch up with County Leitrim Sheep Farmer John O'Connell, who's also a participant in the Chaco Signpost Program. We discuss grazing management this autumn and some of the challenges and benefits John has seen moving to grazing over the past number of years. John talks to us about maintaining your condition, the move to winter shear and yews in recent seasons, as well as why he's moved to precision shop silage to feed the yews and slats. We discuss the scan results this year and its plans for feeding this spring, and the importance of getting the basics right now as you prepare for lambing. We start off here with John chatting about what's been happening on the farm in the past couple of weeks as he's housed the yew flock. So in the last um, week or two, basically since since Christmas, um, and all yours have, have been brought back to the home farm and housed. A um, little bit of a challenge trying to get them in and get them in dry um, because of the fact that I want to winter shear, uh, I obviously want to get them dry. So brought them home, housed them, uh, tried to shear them one of the days. Uh, we only got a certain percentage of them sheared and we're actually going back shearing the rest of them today. So... The yews are sheared, uh, we'd say, and, and into the sheds. The yew lambs are in, and uh, scanning took place yesterday. It's been, it's been a busy couple of weeks. John, just uh, like, I'll take me back a wee bit here on this one. You get a lot of winter grades, but you might just take us back. Like, the autumn for you, you came into the autumn, and anyone listening in the southeast might find this one hard to believe. You came into the autumn with a lot of grass. You had good covers. Um, was it one of those challenges, though? Very challenging. As you said there, I had an abundance of grass, but the big issue was trying to get it grazed out and get the proper clean outs in my, in my, my closing plan. So I always uh, close up, obviously, the paddocks closest to the house and the most sheltered paddocks. And I usually start closing up from the end of September, the middle of October onwards. Um, but there was a challenge this year because of the fact that some very heavy covers of grass and ground got so wet. So I just sort of had to keep moving them across it and and in some cases, I brought them back to maybe get a slightly better clean out on some of the paddocks, but I still was sticking to my, my closing plan as best I could. Look, an ideal scenario, one way coming in with a good cover at the back end, but just October, late September, October, due, we got very wet conditions, were difficult. Yeah, 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 it was difficult. It was like, as I said, the utilisation was very poor, very poor at times. Look, John, and, you're you're probably aiming for a slightly earlier housing. I suspect I'm also. You normally get a bit of winter graze in most years. How did it pan out this year for you? Well, I suppose in some ways, because of the wet back end, um, a bit of winter graze came on came on stream that I wasn't really expecting to get. So that was a bonus, really, because as I said, the utilization wasn't as good for me. I, I had anticipated that I'd be housing yours earlier than other years, but all of a sudden. Um, Quite a bit of winter grazing came on, on stream, so I, I availed of that and I got yours away. Uh, so my own ground would have been closed up. The last yours left my own ground on the 5th of December. So I was able to stick to my closing plan fairly good. And I got yours away to a few different places on, on winter grazing with great heavy covers of grass. So I suppose, John, the big advantage there was you got 100% closed up in your home farm area. I'm assuming that's all it's post-mating. Like, what kind of covers are you talking about in the farm at that stage? So a closing cover then, Kieran, when I was when I was moving off the home farm at 550 to 600 for closing cover uh, and got all the yews moved off the home farm then and uh, got a bit of winter grazed. And then, of course, the advantage then, the flexibility was I was able to move groups, uh, yews around in smaller groups on winter grazing. It, it's it's sometimes winter grazing might be fenced for sheep, uh, but I, I was able to move them around in smaller groups and get them off onto these good covers of grass. Susan, and summer too, I suppose that cold snap, you probably got a wee bit more out of it than you expected as well. Yes and no. Yeah, it was it, it was a, it was an advantage in ways, but uh, in, in some other ways, uh, the, the, the ground, kind of, even though it was hard and that, and it, it didn't affect your condition or anything like that, but I, I was a little bit concerned. I just thought that maybe it was time to start pulling them in, but I was able to keep them out, as I said, until after Christmas. You, t- you touched there on your condition, like... Uh, how has it been for you this year? Like typically, we'd see most wet winters, a bit challenging on condition. You probably came into October in very good condition for the mules. Yeah, the yours went to the ram in, in, in good condition. Uh, uh, the yours went in a, a body condition score of three point four going to the ram, and they seemed to hold that condition very well. And that was part of the reason why during that that uh, October, that really wet period when the rams were going out with yours, I was concerned about 
about grass utilization and being able to keep that body condition on the O's. I didn't want it to slip at that stage in, in particular. So it did, it, it's, it, they've, they've held their condition very well. As I said, they've been housed now. Uh, they've been through the, uh, the foot bath and as they were going in for the for a foot bath, I, I, I checked the body condition and that uh, will be monitored again and checked uh, as, as I'm going say, over the next few weeks. You threw the figure there, 3.4 in general. I'm assuming that, that's an average. We, we often yeah. chat about this before. It's kind of the extremes at either end. You probably hadn't too many at the lower end of that. We're fairly close, I imagine. Yeah, the percentage we say under three was was very small, which is I suppose one of the figures we'd be looking at. And um, most of the yours were up at the three point four. Like obviously, you get the few exceptional yours that are body condition score of four. But but the figure that I, the part I'd be focusing on would be the the ones that are dropping below that three or up to three point one or three point two. And there was very small percentage in that. I think it was only four or five, six percent of them that I had a, that I had to watch out for there. And then, then the advantage the fact that they weren't under pressure on winter grazing, and it, it held the condition for you. But Johnny, you were talking here about winter shearing. You've moved more towards winter shearing in the last couple of years. Maybe you'll just tell us why. Well, there's a few reasons. Because I'm housing yours, predominantly most of yours are housed on plastic slats. And I find uh, with the with the yours and winter shorn, uh, the fact that the yours are winter shorn and that I'm feeding them precision chopped silage, uh, the yours stay very clean on the slats. The other reason, obvious reason, I suppose, is that you can fit more yours more comfortably uh, in a pen when they're shorn. It's another way of maybe being able to monitor body condition on yours. And you will have a slightly heavier lamb at birth, usually, with them because the yours seem to be that little bit hungrier. They seem to eat that bit more. So, um, by and large, you will notice your, your birth birth weight is a little bit, a little bit heavier. But the main reasons for me is just the cleanliness of yours on the slats and no issues of mastitis. Now, the one thing about it is it's very important to get that shearing done and have a, a sort of a 10 week, eight to 10 weeks of all back on them before they're heading back out to the field in spring. I suppose, John, look, the, the, the practical management benefits of seeing things and I put them as well in the pens, but, and as you said, it's easier to monitor condition on them. Um, you wore, though, in the system, I think when you moved into that first, you told me this before, you were kind of shearing... It was every second winter, was it, Joe, winter shearing? You won't yeah, so, shearing as well. Yeah, so what would happen is, say, I shared this winter, then I wouldn't share until late summer. Then I started doing me then until the following winter, and then the following spring I'd share early summer, and then the following winter I'd share again. So it was a kind of every second winter I was winter shearing. But in the last year or two, I've, for instance, this whole year I got away without shearing the whole summer. Now, having said that, the big issue in the back end of the year this year was your starting to get in the back between good body condition on them and the fact that they hadn't been shorn all year. There was a lot more, we'd say, keeping a closer eye on them and uh, that, the, that they didn't lose any on their back. But that's another great advantage of having them shorn now. I used to have an issue when they were going to grass and spring to them with them, but they were getting on their back and you go out and you find a yo on her back and maybe dead or two good lambs beside her or on her back for a few hours and get her off. That's not an issue anymore. When I get the oats to grass in spring, it's one thing I don't have to be looking out for anymore is um, on their back due to the, the big fleece of wool. So that's that's a big advantage. You you moved away from that name once this with just that bit more vigilance in the back end. Yeah. But just touching something else here, precision shop silage, um, like I know you make a lot of bales and a lot of surplus of paddocks, but you've moved a wee bit more towards a dedicated precision shop silage pit in the last two or yeah, three seasons it, as well. That's exactly it. It's only a small pit of silage, but it's precision chop. I'm just, I have, I've tried everything over the years with the plastic slats. They're ideal, they're brilliant in every way, but even with the round bales of silage shredded, they're still inclined to pull. And anybody out there that has plastic slats, I'm sure they see it themselves or expanded metal or even the wooden slats, they find that it's very hard to keep them clean. Whereas with the precision chop silage, uh, between that and the fact that the yours are shorn, the yours are spotlessly clean all winter long, and it's not an issue even at Lamentine. Mastitis is another thing, of course, as I said. Um, so I find the precision chop really good. It just makes life so much easier. Um, so I try to make that little bit of a small pit of precision chop silage, good quality silage to have for the yours. So it's not that the bales won't work, but just the precision chop is a lot easier for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just for feeding out, it definitely is. John, if we maybe get down to the business end of a league from a breeding point of view, 
um, you're saying you've you've scanned this week. You you might just tell us like how's that's gone? Maybe what's happened with breeding this year? How many went to the Ram? What kind of Rams you were using? I had a, a team of Rams. I had eight Rams. Um, I had Beltier Rams. Uh, Beltier Rams running with with, with black face yos, and I had uh, Suffolk Rams running with with white face yos. I had a a Texas Ram uh, for more or less tidying up. Then he went out a little bit later. And I had some Charlie Rams then. Charlie Rams running mostly with the Yole Rams. Um, so the Rams, they obviously, as I said, they have been pulled. The Rams were pulled after four uh, four weeks, four little over four to five weeks with the Yoles and around the same time with the Yole Rams to try and keep the lamb in fairly compact. We scanned uh, yesterday, uh, very good scanning yesterday with the Yoles and the Yole Rams and very few empties. Um, so I'm at this stage now, what will be done now in the next is the next day or so is to regroup the O's according to the scan rate so that and re pen them so they'll be all penned according to how they're scanned and also body condition score. Um, the O's scanned at uh, slightly over two uh, scanning rate and a litter size of 2.08, so almost 2.1, and the OLAM scanned. Um, litter size of 1.3 and a scanning rate of um, litter size of 1.48 so there's very few empty in each bunch You're very happy with that John, it's starting you off with a good crop coming into the year Yeah, this, uh, this is a good, it was a good scan it's a, it's a nice scan, I would call it a nice scan and that is not, it's not uh, exceptionally high but it's a scan that's fairly manageable, you know. Um, I'll, I'll work with, uh, as I said, with, with triplets. I'll work with that and I'll, I'll, I'll be able to handle them from the, the sort of surplus lambs. I try not to put yours to the field with, with triplets if I can at all. So it's a, it's a good scan. And um, the next job now is to, is to group them up accordingly to how they're scanned and start feeding according to that. John, just what you say, talking about starting feeding, like you're not starting now until mid March. When will you start introducing feed? I'm assuming with the old lambs, they'll probably start on it a bit earlier. And just you might take us through your system. Kind of the plan, Kieran, with them is when I introduce meal to the triplet beer and yours, I introduce, or when I introduce concentrate to triplet beer and yours, I usually introduce concentrate to all the old lambs at the same time, regardless of, what, of how they scan. Because of the fact that they're still growing, they're still very young, um, they need that little bit of preferential treatment right through from now, right through until next June, July, August, until they have their lambs weaned and until they're nearly going to the ram again. I kind of treat them, that get that little bit of preferential treatment the whole way through. So the O's will be, will be uh, grouped now, probably today. Um, triplet bear and yours will be penned together. Twin bear and yours will be penned and single bear and yours will be penned. And... The yole lambs, regardless of what they're carrying, will probably be running, uh, penned in more or less one group or two or three groups, but they'll be treated the same as the triplet yoles. So I'll be introducing concentrate um, to the triplets and to the, the yole lambs in the next two to three weeks. Um, I find it's important to go in that little bit earlier with the yole lambs, regardless of, of how they scan and have that little bit, if it's only 300 grams per day, to just get it into them, it, it seems to pay dividends down the road, further down the road with the, with the old lambs, and it keeps them right and keeps that condition on them. And, and as they're lambing down, it, the, the knock-on effect is they'll have more milk and they're just that bit stronger for, for lambing down and rearing their lamb or their two lambs. John, you, you have a busy couple of weeks ahead. You're getting ready for, you're putting in the groundwork now for lambing them. You touched on something there, like starting early, dividing them out early, having that set up and system in place, it does have rewards when it comes to lambing for you like you, you've had ups and downs over the years you've, I mean, you've modified the system to suit it yeah it's just I think here in, uh, all this pre-planning makes life enough like, as we all know out there at lambing time it's one of the busiest if not the busiest times of the year and you're under enough pressure as it is when you're lambing uh, there's, there's, there's an awful lot going on and you just have so much going on they want to make life that little bit easier and the weeks leading up to it if you sort of get these little Subtle things right, it can make life an awful lot easier than just when you're in the thick of it. So one of the things I do is I, I group yours, as I said, according to the litter size, but I also pull off any yours that are a little bit under on condition. So if I had a yore that was carrying twins and I said she's a little bit light on condition, she might be on your body condition score of which a 3.2, 3.3. Uh, ideally, I'd like to have them all a body condition score of 3.5. 
And you will have the odd one, no matter how you do, that has lost a little bit of condition for whatever reason. She may have had a sore foot earlier on the year. And I'm inclined to regroup them, put them in with the triplet pair and yours. Uh, and then likewise, if I had a, a yolk high and a single, and she was a little bit bare of herself, I'd be inclined to put her in with the twin bear and yours, because I'd be starting that meal feeding that little bit sooner with the twin bear and yours than I would be with the single. So usually rule of thumb is I start the triplets uh, if all oh, you know, quality of silage is important, and I have the quality the silage tested, and I know how good the silage is, so then I can work with from whatever the quality of the silage is. I know when I have to start when I'm a concentrate, and I also know um, how the yours have scanned. So using them, few metrics, I suppose, I can make a few decisions on that and have these things done well in advance of before lambing takes place. It just means that when lambing starts, that it makes life that little bit simpler and that little bit easier. John, thanks very much for that update today. It was great hearing again about your system. I'm sure we'll have you on again at a later date. Thanks very much, Kieran. We're going to leave it there for this week's episode. Some very good advice from John over what we need to look at on flocks over the next couple of weeks. And putting in that effort now really does pay dividends when it comes to lambing. That's it for me for this episode. Again, for updates from our sheep programme, keep an eye on our Twitter page at Jogger Sheep. I'm Kieran Lynch. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe and tune in to future episodes.